The Acolyte, Episode 6, Teach and Corrupt Osho wakes up to find herself on an unknown planet, soon realizing that she was brought here by none other than Kimir, the very man who killed everyone around her, at least to her knowledge back on Kofar. However, rather than taking the chances he gives her to either kill him or run away, Osha instead decides to stay with the Sith Lord. A no-brainer move, right? <sighs> During their time together, Kimir claims to be a former Jedi a very long time ago, who was once betrayed by his own master, even showcasing the whip-like scar on his back to Osha. And Osha questions him on this, asking how could he be a Jedi when she's never heard of him? Then asking about his master, which he doesn't respond. And uh, here's where I have to interject. First of all, does Osha not realize there are tens of thousands of Jedi in the galaxy? There's no way she would know every single Jedi, so why on earth does she make a big deal that she's never heard of Kimir? Besides, why even ask that question and not the one about him being seemingly a Jedi a very long time ago, where Kimir is still relatively a young guy? So yeah, how long ago are we talking about here? And as for his scar, I guess it's possible the show is trying to have us believe that perhaps Vernestra was Kamir's former master. Only due to the fact that she's the only Jedi that we know of that has a light whip instead of a lightsaber. And of course, that scar on Kimir's back looks very much like it was done by a whip, so... Huh, um, yeah, I'm not sure if this is the show trying to pull a fast one on us or just straight up being too obvious for its own good like they were with Kimir being the Sith Lord. As I kind of have a hard time believing Vern, at least from how we know of her from the books, to do something this dark, but eh, guess we'll see. Now as for Osha, we've got a lot to talk about here as this very whole episode deals with Kimir seducing Osha to the dark side. And what's funny is that Osha even tells Kimir that she's not her sister and not as easily manipulated. And, well, uh, we fast forward things a bit, Kimir gets naked for her, then afterwards makes Osha some soup, and that apparently was all that was needed to convince her to go to the dark side. A couple of hours, show her some skin and provide her a hot meal and she's now intrigued very much in the dark side. So much she even tries his helmet. Like, it's no doubt an unorthodox dark side seduction technique by Kimir, but hey, it works, it works, especially on a weak mind like Osha, so yeah, I'll give him that. Can't really complain with the results, right? Before, I used to think that Mei was the worst twin on this show, but Osha is now seemingly competing for that title with her own flip-flopping, and uh, not to mention who in the world gets sexually aroused by the creepy dude who just murdered all of your friends right in front of you. Yeah, this girl has serious, serious issues, and I don't blame the Jedi for dropping her one bit. Now, speaking about the Jedi, I am disappointed that Kamir reveals himself to be a former Jedi, as I was hoping for him to be a pure Sith. And if he is supposed to be the canon version of Darth Venomous, then it seems like that species swapping was not the only change that Lucasfilm Disney did with the lore in that respect. Still, who's to say anything coming out of Kamir's mouth at this point is even true? I will say though, Kamir seems to have set up an impressive camp in a Cortosis mountain of all places. Which, if you really think about it, is a pretty sweet pad with a beachfront property and his very own lagoon and all. Now, it was interesting that the show didn't want to specify which planet Kamir's base is located on, but Given everything that we've seen thus far, especially the Cortosis vein in the mountain, then it's gotta be Baldemnik. 
as its Legends Planet description fits this one to a T. And of course, Baldemnik was the planet where Darth Tenebris and Plagueis ran their operation from back in Legends. So yeah, it can't be a coincidence that it's being used here now. Plus, the more I look at Kimir's ship, the more that it reminds me of Darth Maul's ship. Which, believe it or not, was originally built by Tenebris. So, does that mean Tenebris also built Kimir's ship too? Uh, maybe, maybe. Eventually, like I mentioned, Kimir also talks Osha into trying on his helmet. Which, yeah, on one hand, I am glad that we did at least get confirmation that it is indeed made out of cortosis. But on the other, I had trouble understanding the logic of it, as Kimir tells Osha that wearing it essentially leaves you blind and makes you need to use the Force and rely on it to see and fight with it on. But we also know at the same time that it blocks the Force from coming inside. As an example, you know, a Jedi can't read your mind if you're wearing it. So, how is this possible again? The Force is blocked from the helmet, yet at the same time allows the Force inside for the user to rely on said Force. Man, that makes no sense whatsoever. Also, I have to ask, why is Kimir so calm this entire time too? As like he said himself, he needed to kill everyone on Kofar so there were no survivors. But of course there were, such as Jedi Master Soul. So as far as all he knows, Soul probably told the Jedi about what happened and the Sith are no longer a secret. And just like that, Kimir blew it. And yet, well, you wouldn't know it by his breezeless, casual attitude here. Elsewhere in Soul's Jedi shuttle at Kafar, Wait, hold up. How is it that they're still sitting at Kafar after getting to their ship first, while in all this time, Kimir was able to get Osha, carry her for hours back to his ship and fly her to his unknown base camp world planet, and Sol in this entire time has just been chilling here? Huh? <laughs> make it make sense. Anyway, some interference disrupts Sol's attempts to contact the Jedi Council when he tries sending an emergency call on what just had happened, leaving the Jedi only a partial message about Sol losing his whole team. So, that's all they know. Sol then asks Mei to help fix the ship's power, still believing her to be Osha, of course. But Basil, on the other hand, knows full well it's not and attempts to even attack her alongside Pip. And this attempt is nevertheless futile, and is really only played for laughs, ending with Mei factory resetting Pip, essentially killing him, while Basil scurries away. Meanwhile, on Coruscant, Vern hears about Sol's SOS and decides to travel to Kafar to investigate this matter personally, taking only a few Jedi with her and… I'm sorry, but uh, this Mog guy, this Jedi who informs her of Sol's interrupted message… Yeah, he kinda pulled me out of this show and it's not the first time either. I'm starting to feel like all of the nameless Jedi in this show seem like they were just pulled off the street or something and fitted in for robes. It's uh, not great by any means. Then back on Sol's Jedi shuttle, there is a bit of a back and forth between Mei and Sol, with Sol the whole time being angry at himself for how he didn't sense or read Kimir's mind back in episode 2. As for him not to know who Kimir truly was, and well, soul buddy old pal, I gotta ask, why are you beating yourself up over that when you can't even figure out that this entire time, that's not actually Osha in front of you? But luckily for him, Mei later tries to get Soul to tell her the truth about what happened on Brendok. But her wording reveals to him that she's not Osha. 
and when the ship's power is eventually restored and Mei tries to let the Jedi know about their position, she's suddenly stunned by Sol, which sees him turn off the transmitter and leaves Kofar with her just... Oh, um, wait, what? Okay, um... He turns off the transmitter and leaves Kafar with her just as Vernestra's Jedi group arrive to investigate his message. And, uh, wait, uh, what is this? On one hand, I was so glad to see Sol finally come to his senses and realize that was Mei pretending to be Osha. But at the same time, I'm so conflicted with this scene. Like, I mean, first Mei was trying to cut communication from the ship, and then when the communication comes back online, she now wants to send an SOS distress call to the Jedi? Why? I thought she was trying to keep things quiet to kill Sol. Which, I mean, to be fair, she had a few good opportunities to do so, but failed to execute. And then on the other hand, Sol sees that the communications are back online and instead of immediately letting the Jedi know what happened and that there is a Sith on the loose, he instead turns the transmitter off to tie down Mei and then sit in the corner in silence, waiting for her to wake up? All while the Jedi are now confused on what's going on with all of these dead bodies and start assuming that Sol's the culprit now. I mean, come on Sol, even then you can't spare a minute or two to communicate the vital information to the Jedi? And then, okay, go tie up Mei and then go back to talk to the Jedi, not just sit in the corner twiddling your thumbs while watching someone passed out? It makes no sense whatsoever, and the writing here is trying to forcefully make Soul out to be some kind of dimwit. And yeah, that's exactly what happens. Vern's Jedi group arrive at the location of the battle's aftermath, and with no information on what happened, but that a bunch of Jedi are now dead and the sole survivor, being of course Soul, is nowhere to be seen, nor is he communicating with them. Basically, he's gone AWOL, thus now having the Jedi assume that Sol has, you know, gone rogue. Which, I mean, to be fair, it's certainly looking plausible from their point of view. And, uh, that all said, remind me again how did Vern and her Jedi group know exactly where to go on Kofar and where Kilnaka's home was? As, shouldn't they need a tracker like Sol's group had Basil? Yet they arrive here like it was no problem whatsoever. <sighs> yeah, I'm not even gonna bother explaining. This is something the writers clearly forgot about and it's not the first time either. Overall, I didn't care too much for this episode and quickly found that the negatives vastly outshine the positives here. Now, starting with the positives, and there are some, First, hats off to the director for the exceptional visuals, blocking, and camera movement, which as they were far superior to any other episode this season. So yeah, while the episode was poorly written, at least visually everything looked great. And after last week's intense action-packed episode, a quieter, character-focused episode like this was a welcome change as this episode has steered the series into an interesting direction, which is both promising but also problematic, and I'm starting to not even like Ocean now. Sure, while I appreciated the callbacks to Legends and the Sith perspective in the Kimir scenes, but uh, Osha's flip-flopping, mirroring her sister Mei was just absolutely frustrating. And turning Jedi Master Soul into some kind of dimwit was truly next level and not in the good way. Combined with the consistently poor writing that the Acolyte is known for and the episode's brief 31 minute runtime, 
Well then, the show once again has fallen short of expectations despite having such a massive budget. I mean, you'd expect better writers to be hired and of course naturally longer episodes too for that kind of money. Ultimately, while this series does show some promise every now and then, it almost always finds a way to keep falling on its face again and again. And that was my take on this episode of The Acolyte. Let me know what you all thought about this episode in the comments below, and if you haven't already, remember to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you on the next one.